good morning, everyone. We welcome you all to the second day of this international conference on the garden in 19th century India. We will start today with the second keynote session of the conference. In this session, we have Professor Joyanto Shengupto as the chairperson and Dr. Andrew Rudd as our speaker. I would now request them to come and take their seats. Shomita Sen will now felicitate Dr. Rudd. Our chair for this session, Professor Joyanto Shengupto, is currently director of Victoria Memorial Hall, India's most visited museum and a leading museum of Indo-British history. He is also the former director in charge of the Indian Museum, Kolkata, and the Anthropological Survey of India. He was educated at Presidency College, now University, Kolkata, and the University of Calcutta, and earned his PhD degree in history from the University of Cambridge. During the two and a half decades before joining the Victoria Memorial Hall in 2013, he taught history at Jadhapur University, Kolkata, and the University of Notre Dame in the United States, and has also held visiting professorships at the universities of Cambridge, Heidelberg, Pennsylvania, Calcutta, and Utah State University. His research focuses on the interrelationship between colonialism, nationalism, democracy, and authoritarianism in modern South Asia, cultural practices in modern India, and transnational and comparative intellectual history. His first book titled, At the Margins, Discourses of Development, Democracy, and Regionalism in Orissa was published by Oxford University Press in 2015. With these words, I now request Professor Shen Gupta to conduct the rest of the session. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so today, we had a very fascinating series of uh, sessions, series of conversations on the first day yesterday. And today, we look forward to uh, a full day of more fascinating conversations on various aspects of the garden in 19th century India. And of course, we will veer off to the back to the 18th century as well as to the 20th. So this is a long view, and uh, it, it's, it's a great pleasure and a personal privilege to be requested to chair this session in which we have the second keynote speaker of our conference, Dr. Andrew Rudd. Uh, and we are especially grateful to Andrew because he has come all the way from Exeter at very short notice, agreeing to be our keynote speaker. And he has come uh, at his own expense. We could not support him, so he has paid for his travel and accommodation and everything uh, on his own. So we are especially grateful to Andrew for, uh, <coughs> for doing this for us uh, and, and um, agreeing to give uh, an overview of the landscape garden, the concept of landscape garden. Um, so his, his talk is titled Landscapes of, uh, sorry, Contours of the Landscape Garden. Uh, it's a broad overview. Uh, I'll just <coughs> uh, read out a very brief bio note of Dr. Andrew Rudd. Dr. Andrew Rudd is currently senior lecturer in the Department of English at the University of Exeter. He holds a PhD degree from the University of Cambridge and has studied at the University of Durham, Trinity College, Cambridge, and Yale University. He has held numerous fellowships, most recently at Yale University's Lewis Walpole Library and at the School of Advanced Studies in English, Jadapur University. Uh, in fact, this is, as we were discussing yesterday, this is probably the fifth or sixth trip to Kolkata by Andrew. He has worked here before in Jadapur University in the Asiatic Society, and he is uh, uh, among, he, uh, among the other people in the 18th and 19th century that he has studies. There is Sir William Jones, who will probably come up during this session or not. Yes, possibly. Uh, Dr. Rad researches and teaches British literature of the 18th century and the Romantic period. 
His monograph titled Sympathy and India in British Literature, 1770 to 1830, was published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2011. And he's currently writing a cultural history of charity in the 18th century. And that book builds on the experience he acquired as parliamentary manager at the Charity Commission for England and Wales before joining the University of Exeter in 2013. Since 2015, he has also been a member of the Peer Review College of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, AHRC. Dr. Rad is one of the key figures in the collaborative research and exhibition project on colonial India's natural history, recently undertaken by the University of Exeter, the Royal Albert Memorial Museum, Exeter, and the Victoria Memorial Hall. Uh, and in connection to this, he was here back in November, only less than three months ago, um, speaking on the exhibition pro project, exhibition and research project. So it's um, a privilege uh, and an honor to have him back here uh, to deliver the second keynote address on contours of the landscape garden. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Andrew Rudd. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chowdhury and Dr. Sengupta, for that uh, kind introduction. And um, it's a real pleasure to be uh, here with everybody. And um, thank you to um, uh, uh, Gianta and to WBSU uh, for uh, this very, very kind um, invitation. Um, I'm going to talk um, about three things um, over the course of the next uh, 30, 45 minutes or so. Um, I'll just start off with a, an overview of the emergence of the um, landscape garden tradition predominantly um, in Britain, but, but thinking a bit about how uh, it could be exported um, and reconsidered in a global context. Um, then I'm going to talk uh, briefly about some of the uh, academic and methodological uh, issues that um, the study of landscape gardening has thrown up. Um, and then the, uh, the talk will um, finish with quite uh, sort of rough notes towards future directions for um, the study um, of, of the garden that, that emerge from the conclusions of the talk. So, okay. I'll start off with um, words from the famous study by Raymond Williams, uh, The Country and the City, uh, published in 1973. Um, these words are about the search for a golden age of the perfect landscape, which always seems to exist beyond the horizon of the past. Um, we are being carried along, so Raymond Williams says, away from that ideal on the escalator of history. Where indeed shall we go before the escalator stops? One answer, of course, is Eden, and we shall have to look at that well-remembered garden again. But first, we must get off the escalator and consider its general movement. Interesting words from Williams to remind us that there is, there was no golden age of landscape. Landscape is always now of the moment. And it is apropos of the subject of this seminar, Williams noted all along that these ideas of landscape applied both to Britain and its colonies. But he noted that within that notion of landscape, a fixed idea of the English landscape predominated. Uh, Williams would argue that this was always a false nostalgia for that ideal. Um, on the screen, I will show one obvious historically contingent shift from the 17th century ideal of what a perfect garden looked like to an 18th century one. Um, here are two formal landscape gardens, uh, both from the early modern period, the 17th century. Um, on the left, hope, hopefully displaying clearly enough for you, um, is a picture of Denham Place in Buckinghamshire, um, the picture done in the year 1695. And on the right, of course, is the Taj Mahal, um, constructed 1752 um, uh, by Ahmed Lahori. Now, we are struck by the basic similarity of conception in these gardens, and this points to one theme I wish to highlight, um, that of the global interconnectedness 
of garden and landscape design. As at the root of both these gardens, I think, um, is a reflection of the idea of a religious paradise. Um, both these gardens, one, the one on the left much more modest, the one on the right obviously grander, um, they both present a, a locus aminus, uh, they are both geometric in design, and the underlying idea of both, I suggest, is uh, mastery over the unruly aspects of nature and an attempt to fulfill God's design for humankind to husband the earth. Moving on, here obviously is a very different interpretation of what an ideal landscape garden should look like. Um, these are Lancelot Capability Brown's designs at Burley House in Cambridgeshire in England. Now the house was built uh, between 1558 and 87 for William Cecil, Lord Burley, who was uh, Queen Elizabeth I's Lord Treasurer. This was built 100 years before the Taj. Now there is a neat symmetry here because Lancelot Capability Brown's designs were implemented 1754 to 77, uh, roughly 100 years after the Taj. Although a noted feature of Brown's designs is that he re retained many older plantations in this landscape. He followed the dictum of Alexander Pope that when designing a landscape garden, you should consult the genius of the place uh, and you should leave behind those elements that belong to the place and improve uh, where improvements can be made. So here you can see on the screen um, Burley House, a Tudor, huge Tudor palace in the background, and you can see a characteristic sweep of water in front of it, and you can see grazed lawns with the sheep keeping the grass down, and you can see uh, artfully placed plantations of trees which frame the view into something that is intended to look like uh, an ideal landscape um, loosely modelled on the 17th century landscapes of uh, Claude Lorraine. Now Lord Burley would perhaps have been baffled by the appearance of this, which at first sight makes so little effort to gather nature into an orderly design. Uh, but it is, of course, every bit as much a work of art. In Tom Stoppard's play, Arcadia, I don't know if anyone has uh, read or seen this um, fine response to landscape theory, the character Hannah Jarvis declares that English landscape was invented by gardeners imitating foreign painters who were evoking classical authors. And she summarizes Capability Brown doing Claude who was doing Virgil. But the Christian God is still in the garden. Um, the advent of physico-theology described by William Derham in 1713, the theory that God's designs are best appreciated through the study of nature, meant that the, nat the more natural seeming the garden, the more it revealed of God's handiwork and mind. That uh, William Derham text and physico-theology are important reference points for the 18th century tradition, I think. Um, just as an aside, um, here is uh, Lancelot uh, Capability Brown, a figure who may be well, well known to many of you. Um, there is his, his portrait on the right. And um, in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, there is a little, a sweet little um, manuscript poem to him written by William Whitehead around the year 1783, which is on the left here. Um, beneath his plastic hand, his keener view, Albion, the world's fair garden, fairer grew, says the manuscript poem. Now, the reference to nation and nationhood is important. Um, there is the sense that England's landscape was the fairest of them all. And there is also this sense of license, uh, whereby if, like Brown, you have got your principles right, um, then your plastic hand can imitate God uh, to polish, as it were, what God has left you. And the sense is also there that God would be pleased about what you were doing. Now, I think this explains some of the boldness of English landscape design uh, in the 18th century, uh, both in their own country um, and overseas. 
I think that is what lies at, at the root of that, that boldness. Um, the key concept is improvement. Um, here on the screen are two images from a famous work by William Gilpin, the preeminent theorist of the picturesque in England. Um, and these images here uh, demonstrate the aesthetic improvement of uh, an existing landscape. Um, I say existing landscape, obviously, because the landscape at the top is obviously false. Uh, it's a hypothetical existing landscape. Um, these, incidentally, in the, in the actual book, are two very beautiful um, watercolours that are tipped into the volume, and you compare them. Uh, but somebody has helpfully put them side by side on the screen, so I thought I'd copy that off rather than photographing my own copy. Anyway, um, at the top is our hypothetical um, pre-existing landscape. Um, one that uh, follows the uh, uh, aesthetic ideas of Edmund Burke in his study on the, the sublime and the beautiful. This is a beautiful landscape, which basically consists of three smooth hills, uh, one in front of the other. Now, William Gilpin says, this is not picturesque. This is not the sort of landscape we want. Um, because it does not interest the eye sufficiently, it is insufficiently variegated, that is a term that's very important in the picturesque, uh, and the lower image here suggests ways that this beautiful landscape uh, can be improved and turned into something that is more aesthetically pleasing, more interesting to the eye, and more likely to generate uh, philosophical reflections. And you can see that what William Gilpin is doing uh, is effectively sort of smashing up that landscape, um, to draw it closer towards Edmund Burke's ideas of the sublime, that is something that is sort of rougher, um, invoking more terrible um, uh, ideas. And he has chipped away a huge chunk of the hill on the right, um, uh, chiseled away at the hill on the left. It's difficult to see, but there is a ruined castle on it to interest the eye. Um, and the eye is guided in a serpentine path through the landscape towards the mountains beyond, and ultimately, if we're, if we're going to be fully philosophical about it, upwards to consider we are on the footstool of God, and up we go to consider the, the creator. Um, it's rather similar to what William Gilpin was suggesting when he looked at the ruins of Tintin Abbey, um, in the Wye Valley, which he didn't think, the ruined uh, Cistercian medieval monastery, which he didn't think were quite picturesque enough. Uh, and in another book, he speculated that you might usefully take a mallet to the medieval ruins and chip a bit off to make them perfectly picturesque. You could take a mallet, he said, but who durst use it? Um, here's another example of uh, improvement in landscape design on the screen. This is Stoneley Abbey in Warwickshire. Um, and this is a proposal by another major um, landscape designer and improver, Sir Humphrey Repton. Now, Stoneley, Stoneley Abbey is of particular interest to um, those of you who, like me, are <coughs> literature uh, scholars because um, these proposals on the screen were for the Reverend Thomas Lee, um, who was the cousin of Jane Austen's mother, uh, Cassandra, who was born Cassandra Lee. And Jane Austen spent a short amount of time at Stoneley Abbey, um, and the improvements suggested on the screen here are thought to be the model for Southerton Court in Mansfield Park. Um, which Jane Austen Im implicitly criticizes for thoughtless and ostentatious improvement. Um, you may recall, for those of you familiar with that novel. Um, just to explain this, Sir Humphrey Repton was a great um, um, salesman, and um, he had these things called red books, which used paper overlays to show a before and after effect of what he planned to do to your garden. So he drew it as it was, um, and then you could take away the elements of what it was to reveal what it could be if you paid him, Humphrey Repton, a very large amount of money, uh, as the Reverend Thomas Lee was, was proposing. Here's what he proposed to Thomas Lee. Um, you can see at the top, there is Stoneley Abbey um, as it existed. There is a river on its natural path going past, and there's a fairly bare lawn and a clump of, some clump, 
effects of trees in the background. And Humphrey Repton proposed uh, changing the course of the waterway, adding a very ornate classical arcade to the medieval Stonely Abbey, and adding in Grecian classical elements such as an urn here. You, you can see what he is about, and it's up to you whether you regard this as a tasteful improvement uh, or not. Um, in the end, the Reverend Thomas Lee did not go with the classical arcade, but uh, Repton did divert the River Avon um, along the path that, that you see, using armies of diggers and horses and mules in the absence of mechanical equipment. Um, just quickly, there's another famous example, Stourhead Gardens, um, designed for Henry Hoare, H-O-A-R-E, the banker. Uh, again, a serpentine waterway, um, gently curving landscape, a classical temple, uh, neatly positioned um, at the end. That's another famous example. And I want to zero in on a couple of features from Stourhead to illustrate um, another, the next point. Um, I have said that English gardens in this period um, wish to present themselves as, as timeless ideals. Remember that false nostalgia that Raymond Williams mentioned. Uh, but there's a more specific function within that, um, derived from the 18th century notion that landscape should lead to the pleasurable and philosophical association of ideas. Uh, there should be things within your landscape garden to lead your thoughts. Um, and I'm going to suggest over the next few sequence of images uh, that these myths of association are predominantly with uh, dominant cultures of the past. Uh, those are the principal points of reference for all the stylistic variations of, of the English landscape, the elite uh, English landscape garden, which is primarily what we are talking about here. So here on the screen are three uh, examples, all to be found still in the gardens of Stourhead in Wiltshire. You can go and visit these. It's a very beautiful garden. Um, here are obvious reference points to Greco-Roman uh, classical culture. You have to think, why would you put such a thing in an 18th century garden in, in England? Um, there's a Temple of Apollo um, on the left, a uh, Temple of Flora on the right, uh, right top, and right uh, what was originally the Temple of Hercules, uh, but now known as the Pantheon because of its resemblance to the Roman Pantheon um, in Rome. Um, the associations here are with the, the Pantheon of deities of the Greco-Roman world, um, with, with, with poetry and inspiration, Apollo, flora, uh, prosperity, uh, and Hercules' strength. So in the 18th century, these temples are signaling very, very clear virtues to the classically educated um, uh, viewer. Uh, and they are virtues with which the owner of the garden uh, clearly seeks to be associated. Um, but it wasn't just uh, Greco-Roman virtues that could be invoked. Um, here are some other uh, monuments of timeless associationism. Uh, but here, with Gothic uh, or native virtues, ones which relate much more closely to English rather than uh, Mediterranean history. Now, on the left is a very, one of the most curious monuments um, at Stourhead in Wiltshire. Um, this is the so-called Alfred's Tower. Um, a very, very tall watchtower, which you see people driving along the um, A30 road in, in southwest uh, England see this bizarre structure standing on a hilltop and wonder what is that. Well, what it is, is a, a sort of brick skyscraper um, that was built in the grounds of Wiltshire, um, supposedly uh, pretending to be a watchtower built by the, Sax, the great Saxon king, um, Alfred the Great. Uh, this was added to the Stourhead Gardens a little later on um, in the year um, 1772. On the right is 
a structure calling itself Rothley Castle, um, built in 1755. And it is important to note, I mean, it is built in 1775 as a ruin. Um, it is a clear instance of a folly um, built in the mid-18th century, uh, pretending to be uh, an authentic medieval castle. It is not a replica of a medieval castle, of course. Uh, it is one that we imagine to have already fallen down, so it's pretending to be old. Um, it has been, uh, as it were, treated, given the same treatment that um, William Gilpin wished to give to the landscape that was too smooth, too perfect. It has to be roughed up a bit uh, to be made variegated, to be made interesting. Uh, why? Uh, because as a ruin, it facilitates contemplation of the passage of time uh, and of human mortality, so it serves a clear philosophical purpose. Uh, but also, socially, in the context of elite landscape design, um, there is a myth of association with the ruling dominant classes of the past. Um, it is to suggest that uh, barons or knights lived in your garden and that you might be descended from them. Uh, whether that was true or not was a matter for antiquarians and historians to establish, but it was certainly trying to create this sort of fantasy of, of suzerainty um, that is a very, very important feature um, of, of the elite garden. So you could associate yourself with Greco-Roman virtues. Um, you could insert yourself into a fancified uh, idea of native English history, um, such as that of Alfred the Great, or just the, 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 the glorious medieval past in general. Um, and it behoved you to make it look as though your lineage was an old one. Uh, not just um, um, a smooth, modern imitation. And there were garden designers who actually specialized in building these follies. Um, and they, 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 um, they were cautious about how it should be done. There were formulas for how to make your folly look genuinely old and not to make it look as if it was built in 1755. They were quite explicit about this. So there are two follies. Um, but... Let us move on to um, a more um, global context as Britain's horizons uh, expanded um, over the course of the 18th century. Um, here are more myths of association, um, but here obvious reference points are China um, and the virtues of the East as they were perceived. So here are two famous examples which um, still survive. Well, the one on the house is, the one on the left is a bit of a replica, I think, but uh, the design is known. On the left is an example of uh, chinoiserie, um, the taste for uh, China, um, in the gardens at Stowe, another um, great uh, stately home. The Chinese house, um, originally constructed in 1738, and the idea here, again, is that you wander around the garden um, and your eye is drawn to this structure as a curiosity. And inside the house, originally, was a life-size model of a Chinese lady as if she were asleep uh, on a couch. And so the, the visitor would peer into the window and imagine that you were sort of looking at this person um, who was sort of adrift in sort of sleep and dreams. Um, on the right is the pagoda built by William Chambers in 1762 in the Botanic Gardens at Kew uh, in southwest London. Um, this really is an 18th century skyscraper. Uh, it's a very, very tall structure. I think it has about sort of 13 or I can't, can't count them from here, but it, it has many, many stories. Um, I should add that this has recently been uh, restored, and um, I should have put them in the photo, really, but um, now it's, it's been repainted, um, and it has dozens and dozens of gold-leaf-coated dragons, as it originally did, around each of the stories, and it looks absolutely magnificent in a crazy kind of way. 
Um, it is also a very strong structure. It survived um, a, a, a German bomb that fell very near it during the Second World War, but sort of managed to stay up. Um, and it can be seen from the gardens nearby at Strawberry Hill, uh, where Horace Walpole built his villa, and he regarded it as an insufferable eyesore uh, that poked into his garden, if you imagine how it would break into his aesthetic bubble. Um, William Chambers also built other um, monuments at Kew referencing uh, global buildings. He built um, a, a model of the Alhambra, and he also built a model mosque. Um, these buildings, these structures do not survive in the garden, although the designs for them do, so you can see what he was about. But in the case of the Chinese buildings, these ones here, um, these are models that appealed to uh, Enlightenment philosophers uh, because China could be invoked as a rational and monotheistic society and for that reason uh, uh, exerted that kind of appeal. But it's still elite associations. Uh, Confucius and the Chinese emperors are, are the reference points. And lastly, um, here is another frame of reference, um, another frame of associations, this time with uh, Mughal India. Um, here is the splendid, uh, again, crazy house at um, Sezincott in Gloucestershire. Now, Gloucestershire is Nabob country. Uh, nearby is Dalesford, uh, home of Warren Hastings, not far away. And um, Sezincott here was built in uh, 1805 by the architect Samuel Pepys Cockrell for his younger brother, Charles Cockrell, um, who served uh, here in India um, under Wellesley. I should add that um, the Cockrell brothers were great, great nephews of Samuel Pepys, which is why the architect is called Samuel Pepys Cockrell. At Sezincott House, I'm inspired John Nash's redesign of the Brighton Pavilion. Um, and you get the idea fairly clearly from the designs here. It's not a subtle um, invocation of Mughal India particularly, but it is worth noticing the very distinctively English feature that um, the minarets serve as chimneys, of course, because it is cold <laughs> and you have to have a fire in the house in a way that you would not um, <laughs> uh, were one uh, uh, actually here. Okay, now... All of these are associations with um, other uh, cultural elites, uh, and they largely overlook the English um, native vernacular style. So I want to adapt uh, the concept of telescopic philanthropy in Charles Dickens' Bleak House, where you overlook the things that are close to you in favour of a possibly insincere connection with things that are far away, to talk about telescopic associationism in the 18th century landscape garden. Um, and to some extent, all the things I've shown are driven by a cosmopolitan uh, fantasy of common cause with other ruling dynasties, um, an idea written about by David Canadine in his book Ornamentalism, which is about how um, the English and Indian ruling classes created sort of myths of connection between them. I think there is quite a lot of that process going on in, in the gardens. Now, all of this was anathema to uh, many cultural critics uh, in the 1970s and 80s um, who deplored the absence of ordinary people from these ideal landscapes. Um, this Gainsborough painting was often singled out as a culprit. I realize this is not a garden, but, but I'm, I'm just talking about a visual attitude to landscape here. The painting... Gainsborough's Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, dating from 1750, um, shows Robert and Francis Andrews of, of Suffolk. And you can see it's a quintessential image of moneyed landowners standing conveniently to one side of the very large amount of space that they own. I know this seminar as a whole is very concerned with the uh, projection, fetishization of space. Um, and you can see there are no other people in this landscape, although there are signs of human activity. Um, people have been busy farming on the right, and I'm not sure how visible it is right at the back, but you can see the traces of enclosure. There is a fenced field with, with grazing animals in it um, that may well have enclosed a piece of what was formerly um, common land. Um, and so in that period, 
the study of landscape and landscape gardening shifted onto those who were left out, uh, marginalized or erased, or alternatively looked at ways in which the poor and the lower classes could be co-opted uh, into the picturesque. Um, here are two examples of that tendency, another Gainsborough painting, a peasant girl gathering faggots in the wood from 1783, uh, and on the right, George Morland's painting, The Benevolent Sportsman, which shows a man out hunting who was stopped by a gypsy encampment to give money to the poor people living outside that he finds. Uh, the classic study on this topic uh, is John Barrell's Dark Side of the Landscape, uh, which has arguably set the trajectory for much scholarship that has followed ever since. And the point is that the study of landscape was obliged to move out of the garden space, uh, especially the elite garden space, because the latter did not pay due attention to the human element. Uh, indeed, the accusation against the landscape garden was that people had been schematically, ordinary people, had been schematically as well as often literally removed from the garden. Um, it is notoriously true that many uh, villages were, well, not many actually, just, no, there are a few notorious cases of real villages that were removed and relocated in order to construct huge landscape gardens of the sort that I've been um, describing. And um, Oliver Goldsmith's um, fine poem, The Village, uh, describes that sort of effect on a community. Now, all of this leaves our discussions with some interesting potential directions. Um, for one thing, uh, it, it is valuable to consider how both the landscape garden and the picturesque co-option of human inhabitants of the land could be exported um, in the colonial period. Um, here is an example of the dark side of the landscape tendency um, in George Chinnery's village scene in the environs of, of Bengal. Um, and you can notice the picturesque framing of vernacular elements, bearers, <coughs> bullocks, carts, and so forth, all carefully framed and picturesquely graced with uh, chiaroscuro light and shade. Um, and you can see the picturesque framing here uh, of the botanic gardens, uh, today the AJC Bowes botanic gardens, which we're going to hear more about in a fascinating sounding session um, later today. This is a painting by James Bailey Fraser. And you can note elements carried over from the Gainsborough painting um, down to the picturesquely variegated sky. And this picture is something of a hybrid which registers the emergence of a British-style landscape garden uh, on the left with the trees, lawn, and the eye-drawing house, which was the home of the superintendent, William Roxburgh. All that is on the left. Um, but it also registers, while simultaneously making picturesque, the imperial networks that make possible this particular garden and this particular city. Uh, the ocean-going East Indiaman um, in the center, and the small boats that serve her um, gathered all around and shuttling between the botanic garden and the ships and the river and thence to the wider world. Um, for me, there's, a, there's an honesty about this painting uh, that sits alongside the artist's uh, picturesque assimilation of a global system into what appears to be a harmonious, inevitable, natural-seeming whole. That is how the picturesque scheme works in a painting like this. OK, but there, I think there is a problem for us in analyzing the landscape and landscape garden tradition in terms of, in England, uh, class struggle and in India, struggles of race, class, and colonial status. Uh, and I think it's a problem because this approach ultimately rests upon the human-centered, um, anthropocentric notion um, of us humans as the dominant force in the natural environment. Um, if we follow this path, and you'll just have to bear with me as I do, um, we reach the uh, apocalyptic scenario of uh, total human domination of the Earth. 
um, expressed here by Frederick Jameson in 1991, where he talks about the modernization process being complete uh, and nature being gone for good. Um, it has been common to talk of the Anthropocene era, uh, an epoch defined overwhelmingly by human activity, and also the post-human era, where we are, so to speak, punished either by mutating into uh, artificially intelligent hybrids of some sort or by being wiped out altogether um, in a climactic apocalypse. Uh, what use a landscape garden with a Chinese pagoda then? And it was that human-centered uh, impasse that the ecological turn of the late 1980s and 1990s uh, began to address uh, a good and useful example uh, are Jonathan Bates' studies of ecology in romantic poetry, um, which began not to eradicate, but to try to de-center or rebalance the placing of the human um, in the landscape uh, and in the garden. Now, in this final section, I'll turn briefly to the, uh, look briefly at the work of the Botanic Garden in Kolkata um, and a figure who I think deserves some credit for creating uh, an, an alternative way of seeing nature in the landscape. But first, let me read you this. Uh, the modern nature writer, Richard Maybe, on one of my favorite poets, John Clare. John Clare was one of the few writers to have found that shared field and to have created a language that joined rather than separated nature and culture. John Clare once said that he found my poems in the fields. He felt most at home in the open, tangled, undramatic spaces of wasteland and heath. Sorry, that should be heath, not health. He saw the whole living landscape as a kind of common and himself as just one of the commoners. Now, here is a new way of forging a relationship um, with nature outside the grandiose clutches of the landscape tradition. Uh, but how did we come to this potential jumping off point? Well, let me talk briefly about Carl Linnaeus, um, the great Swedish naturalist, and how I think he sits in, into this story. Uh, Linnaeus was born in Sweden in 1707 um, and died there after many travels in, in 1778, having been ennobled. And as you may well know, um, his major work, um, Systema Naturae, the system of nature, divided all living things into one, kingdoms, two, uh, animal, vegetable, mineral, um, two classes, three orders, four genera, and five individual species. And Linnaean binomial nomenclature, naming every species according to two different names combined in the Latin, um, combines the genus and the species, usually an epithet, for example, homo sapiens, wise man, or felis domestica, house cat, domestic cat. Um, and here's his work which on the face of it looks like the ultimate enlightenment taxonomizing schematization. Indeed, it's extremely abstract and you can't read it. This is the animal kingdom, according to, to Linnaeus. But what I want to suggest is that um, the, here is a granular conceptualization of individual species. Uh, let's call them individual forms of life. Uh, like us human beings, this allows you to conceptualize distinct appearances, distinct personality traits, uh, and different relations between different types of creature. Uh, and my contention is that this scheme of Linnaeus and everything that followed from it um, is the enabler of decentering the human um, and learning to commune or common with other species in the way that, that John Clare described. Um, so let us just take the example of the, the common blackbird uh, ringed here in Linnaeus' scheme. It belongs to the animal kingdom, uh, the bird class, which is the second column from the left. Uh, the family is the turdidae, the genus is the turdus, the thrush, that's basically what it is. Uh, and its species is the turdus merula, which literally means uh, the thrush blackbird in Latin. This scheme allows you to zero in uh, on that creature. 
And although this looks very, very abstract, you know, my, my contention is that 18th, figures in the 18th century and afterwards really seized upon the cultural possibilities of this zooming in on something that was quite distinctive and could be described very, very accurately. Um, and here is uh, a nice example of that, that, that zooming in, um, which tries to retain personality and scientific accuracy and consider this creature uh, as a living organism within a habitat. Uh, it is a de-centered, or not, not exactly dehumanized, but rebalanced image um, of, of life on Earth. This is um, Thomas uh, Buick's Blackbird uh, from his gorgeous history of British birds published at the very, very end of the 18th century. Um, I think it's absolutely a charming image uh, and as such often reproduced uh, in Britain. And if you go to any uh, National Trust stately home or any other rather sort of twee um, uh, sort of heritage organization, you often find these images there because of their, their very popular appeal. Uh, but you can see here that we are, this is a blackbird's eye view of the world. Here uh, and the human uh, element is present. You can see in the background there is an enclosed cottage garden, but it's been relegated to the back. You can see the house, you can see the hayrick, but here, imaginatively, we are with the blackbird, with the Linnaean blackbird, I suggest, and we are interested in sort of pebbles, worms, little plants, things that would interest the blackbird. It, it's very, very charming, but I think it also fits into a, a, a wider reconception. Um, of what non-human life on Earth uh, involves. So, coming to the close, um, um, here are two uh, images in what I would suggest is a similar tradition um, from the John Fleming uh, collection uh, held here at Victoria Memorial Hall and which are the subject of the project which Dr. Sengupta uh, alluded to in his introduction. Um, the work of documenting the non-human inhabitants of the earth as fully-fledged individual species uh, went on here um, at the Botanic Garden and among the European and Indian naturalists in Bengal from the late 18th century onwards. Um, the sadly unknown Indian artists of, of these images are clearly preoccupied, like Buick, with capturing the personality um, of these creatures as well as details of their lives in their natural habitat, parts of which have been lovingly reproduced here by either the same artist or two artists working together or whatever. And you can see even the leaves on the left are curling, living, their life cycle is put on the page. Um, and the little bird on the right is sort of sitting in its nest, little chick sitting in its nest singing. Um, and the, these are these are creatures um, conceived of as living through time, highly distinctive, uh, and therefore captured in, in, in tremendous detail. Um, and the work of the Botanic Garden interests me uh, because it was established for scientific as much as aesthetic purposes, uh, although Martin Green has studied it as, a, as an ecological prototype. Uh, and also it interests me because the garden is at the heart of a global network of collecting and recording while paying scrupulous attention to the minutiae of uh, individual species in an individual place. Um, it is attending to the local in the global um, and, and the micro in the macro, which interests me about works like this. And it thus offers a formula for consulting the genius of the place, or we might say the genius of place, while recognizing the global contexts in which individual places are enmeshed. So in conclusion, um, I think we need to adapt Immanuel Kant's um, uh, formula of the universal subjective uh, to think of um, a universal locality uh, or the universal local as a way of calibrating our global concerns with the particularities of, of place. Um, and you can see what I mean by that in uh, various global yet varied initiatives, 
such as urban regreening, where sort of individual places try to create gardens, often out of very sort of unprepossessing, unpromising spaces, uh, and, and rewilding, where no matter what the local habitat may be, it is allowed to sort of re-thrive alongside human activity. Uh, those are examples of what I mean. Um, so I do think that we need to reconceptualize uh, garden space, uh, particularly waste and neglected spaces, um, so that wherever we are, uh, there can be gardens. And we will be able to say with Samuel Taylor Coleridge, no plot so narrow, be but nature there, no waste so vacant, but may well employ each faculty of sense and keep the heart awake to love and beauty. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the absolutely fascinating mm -hmm. overview. Uh, that's uh, uh, the, the evolving contours of the landscape concept and its evolving fantasies uh, with dominant cultures of the past, like the Greco-Roman cultures, uh, and incorporation of those uh, sort of constructed ruins into the fantasies of, of past connections with these uh, <coughs> dominant cultures. Uh, as also the fantasies of the East, fantasies of non-European cultures, um, f and, and how they are also incorporated. But also, uh, you spoke not only about these co-options um, and connections with the past as well as the non-European present, but also of other classes, uh, peasants, workers, and, and so on and so forth. So this, this is an absolutely uh, fascinating overview and full of insights um, and sort of, you know, you know the, 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 uh, the, the vocation of Coleridge's poem and about your, your thoughts about the um, sort of reclaiming uh, so-called wastelands and making them into, into gardens of the future, cultivating the global garden, that has really uh, resonated with the audience here. I'm sure you have many questions. Do we have some time for questions? Do you have? Yeah. So we can we can take some questions. Andrew is here, and it is so. Please uh, please identify yourself and and uh, ask questions. And Andrew, feel free to answer from there or from here as you like. Hello, I'm Amita Sinha, and uh, I am uh, working on heritage, uh, especially the concept of picturesque uh, and how that drives heritage conservation. Um, and I was, uh, I'm thankful for your very informative talk uh, on, on picturesque and I especially like your uh, uh, bringing up the era of the Anthropocene and what it means, uh, you know, in terms of changing the way we um, look at the picturesque. Um, so um, uh, maybe you could share with us how Great Britain is um, is is uh, how this shift is occurring in Great Britain. I think in India, uh, we really do want to move away from the monument centric, the monument in the garden, and the uh, and the cult of the ruin that the picturesque um, you know stemmed from, and uh, look for more ways of engaging uh, with change, uh, the changing landscapes in our heritage sites. Well, thank you. That's that's a very interesting question. I mean, it actually prompts me to say first first of all. Um, that perhaps we should think of um, the picturesque in two distinct senses. Um, there's the, there's the well-known sense, the historically specific sense, which was what I was largely talking about, um, which refers to the preferred uh, aesthetic taste in landscapes uh, in the 18th century uh, and beyond. Uh, but we could also widen that uh, to consider the picturesque just as a literal word, meaning that the, the, the landscape or the gardens we want reflect the sort of picture that we want, whatever picture 
that may be uh, at, at any historical period. So the, the term picturesque could be sort of de uncoupled from uh, the 18th century that way. It would still carry um, a, a weight of uh, problems and issues, of course, of trying to make the landscape look like a, a, a visually uh, pleasing image. But we needn't think of the picturesque solely in terms of the 18th century, perhaps. Um, now, to come on to the, the, the answer to the question, um, I think the, the picturesque in the 18th century historical sense still persists quite strongly um, in, in Britain today. And it's, it is that that you were asking about, I think, isn't it? Um, um, largely um, due to its uh, heritage appeal, um, as you no, no doubt know very well. Um, so um, landscapes on a very grand monumental scale, such as the actual the modern photograph I showed at Stourhead um, and Stowe, are um, preserved in their picturesque state uh, because these are still deemed to carry, I suppose, a sort of classical appeal to tourists and economic reasons lie at the root of that. There is, a, there is an idea of um, heritage, of visual heritage, that is deemed appealing to domestic and international audiences, and the uh, great houses and their stately homes are maintained um, in a state that looks like the ones that I, I have on, on the screen. Um, I think that presents us with some, some questions, and it does, the, these are live debates in the UK, of course, about the, the sort of heritageization uh, of large swathes of the landscape uh, and whether it's something that ought to be um, uh, cultivated uh, because it does attract tourism very, very usefully, or whether it perpetuates this sort of false idea of, of, of landscape. And there are efforts in some places to uh, variegate these monumental landscapes a little more by, by sort of plant re, um, planting wild gardens. Or, or, or sort of turning spaces over to, to, to wildlife in a way that would not have happened in the 18th century. So um, I think that the basic answer to the question is that the, um, the politics, the cultural politics of the picturesque are still, are still alive because the heritage industry in the UK has kept the picturesque alive. But there are, there are these sort of wider theoretical issues of how we consider the sort of physical landscape in relation to our the predominant uh, aesthetic tastes of the day. I think those, that, that practice could still be considered picturesque as well. I just wanted to sort of... Switched this switched on. Okay, it's switched on. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you'd like to uh, give us some idea of the criteria that you think um, would be important in describing something as picturesque. Now, I know this is a difficult one because um, in the sense that uh, the value systems of this country and the UK would differ, and um, even in the definition of the picturesque. And um, again, uh, what comes to mind is the Mughal Garden, mm -hmm. for example, which is not uh, in the in classic sense of the word picturesque in, in, the, in the terms that you define. Uh, or, so I would be interested in knowing if you have any uh, views on the mm. subject. Oh, yes, thank you. Well, the, um, in the first sense in which I use the term picturesque, um, this um, particular aesthetic was actually, it was described fairly closely by many uh, thinkers in the 18th century. Um, um, Gilpin was one of the, 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 the preeminent. Um, uh, Richard Payne Knight was another who thought that the picturesque should be even rougher and even wilder than, than, than Gilpin said. Um, but the, the conventional formulation for the 18th century picturesque is a halfway house between the beautiful uh, and the sublime. Um, so it is neither smooth nor so rough uh, that, it inv that it inspires genuinely terrifying ideas. But variegation is the key word uh, that, that was used. So um, a variety of smooth and rugged objects. Um, that's the overall aesthetic. And then there is also a theory of framing. Uh, and this is where the picture element comes in particularly. Um, it was desirable that a landscape should look, should resemble as closely as possible 
the landscapes of Claude, Lorraine, and Poussin, um, sort of the 17th century French painters, um, whose works were characterized by foliage in, the, in shade, framing the scene in the foreground, and then some serpentine path that would lead the eye from the foreground to the middle ground, uh, then into the background. Uh, and then interesting associational objects disposed throughout the painting, which could either be uh, flocks of sheep or, or grazing animals, so-called staffage, or it could be ruined castles, or it could be biblical and historical figures. Um, so you could, you can reduce the picturesque to uh, a formula of that sort, and many people uh, wrote theories of the picturesque. There was some variation within these theories, as I say. Um, Richard Payne Knight, who wrote a very long uh, three-book poem called The Landscape, a didactic poem, uh, which is a most interesting work um, in heroic couplets, uh, which also in typical 18th century style engages in fierce arguments with his opponents in the footnotes. Um, has a raging argument against both Gilpin and Repton about sort of exactly how rugged um, and how verdured a picturesque landscape should be. Um, there are two images within this poem, both drawn by Richard Payne Knight. Um, and I was initially convinced that his sort of overgrown looking landscape was the one we didn't want. And then there was a smoother one, which is the one that we do want, but he had it the other way round. He wanted the landscape to look virtually overgrown. Um, so, yes, there were formulas fairly close to each other, as I've described, but with some, some variation uh, between them. Um, the wider definition of picturesque we might sort of venture um, is just, if we were to come up with a formula for that, is I would say, you know, the, the application of prevailing aesthetic visual ideas onto the physical landscape. Uh, that, that is a formula I think one could take from any, any period, though it still, it still carries sort of same methodological problems, of course. Okay, so I have a last question. Uh, it's actually a comment. Um, oh, please, please do, yes. Please. So, uh, when the picturesque was brought to India, um, you know, in um, Daniel's paintings and then later in photography, Samuel Byrne, and uh, Taj is a particularly good example of how um, the Mughal aesthetic, uh, you know, which was primarily in terms of visual axes and uh, strict adherence to geometry um, was um, that, mush that Mughal way of seeing w was supplanted by the picturesque way of seeing. So we see always the Taj now in the midst of a thicket, you know, the <laughs> diagonal views uh, rather than the axial views. Whereas it should be s square on in yes. the Mughal way of seeing. Yes, and the Yamuna riverfront, uh, where you see the Taj is surrounded by runes, you know, uh, there are, you know, the, ru the runes of various other palaces, um, and uh, uh, this, this mode of, this way of seeing uh, accompanied uh, the writings on the civilization in decline. And so today, as um, the Taj Gardens are, uh, are maintained by the Archaeological Survey of India, very much in the colonial, uh, image of, uh, you know, the, the garden now, instead of having groves, is now a lawn. And uh, this was Curzon's, you know, um, this was Curzon's, uh, you know, garden, yeah, yeah, idea. <laughs> and um, so, uh, again, in 21st century, you know, uh, um, there, is, there could be a new um, way of looking, a picturesque way of looking at the same landscape. Um, so, for example, a photographer like Raghu Rai, you know, when he when he photographs uh, Yamuna and the Taj, he puts people <laughs> mm. and he puts, you know, spatial practices, cultural practices in the frame. Uh, so I think we are still trying to kind of find our way, you know, to the picturesque of the 21st century. Mm. Yes, that's, that's most interesting. Thank you. Yes, we are, we are not done with the picturesque. It is still a, it is still a sort of presence to be wrestled with. Thank you. Andrew, again, for this fascinating presentation, which uh, I'm sure you have many more questions to ask, uh, but you can always ask them over informal interaction, over tea. Do we have a break now, or do we? Okay. Sure, sure. Okay. So please join me in thanking Professor Andrew Rock.
Thank you, uh, Professor Sengupta, for uh, chairing this session, and uh, Dr. Rad for this excellent and engaging keynote presentation. We now move on. We now move on to our first business session uh, of the day, which will be chaired by Professor Amita Sinha. And here there is a change because uh, instead of Professor Krishna Shen. Uh, Dr. Arnoy Mukhopadhyay will speak along with uh, Professor Nondini Bhattacharya. I invite all of them uh, to come and take their seats. Our chair for this session, Professor Amita Sinha, is a recipient of Fulbright Nehru Professional Excellence Award in 2018 and 19, and is currently a visiting professor in the Department of Architecture and Regional Planning at IIT Kharagpur. She is a former professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. She is author of Landscapes in India, Forms and Meanings, pub published by the Pre University Press of Colorado in 2006. And she is also the editor of Landscape Perception, published by Academic Press in 1995, and the co-editor of Cultural Landscapes of South Asia, Studies in Heritage Conservation and Management by Rattledge in 2017. She was a senior Fulbright researcher at the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage in New Delhi in 2009, and received the National Merit Award, American Society of Landscape Architects for Cultural Heritage Project on Taj Mahal, India in 2000. One. Now we would request Professor Sina uh, to uh, uh, introduce both the speakers and continue with the session. Meanwhile, we will sort out the technical thing, I think. I welcome you to the second session today. Uh, we just heard a very interesting talk uh, by Professor Rudd. And now we have um, Professor Nandini Bhattacharya, who is a professor um, of English and Cultural Studies at the University of Burdwan. She uh, her area of scholarly interest is translation studies, uh, cultural studies, literary historiography, 16th century Bengali and Hindi literature, Gandhi caste studies. This is a very, very wide range. <laughs> 19th century. Uh, I apologize, 19th century. Um, so this is a very wide range. Um, and she has um, edited uh, Gora, a critical companion. I would love to read this. Um, and the annotated comp Kambati. So today her talk is Wasteland to Garden, an Ideological Study of Garden Formation in Colonial India. Please welcome Professor Nandini Bhattacharya. Two of our students, Dipan Dotto and Shagutas Sinharoy, uh, will now uh, felicitate Professor Bhattacharya and Dr. Mukhopadhyay. Thank you very much for uh, having me over. And it's a, such a nice garden. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. And it's most unfortunate that I cannot show whatever I have uh, made. So if that works out uh, subsequently, then well. Uh, right now, I say I am the par and I am the point. And you know, you'll have to just go along with that. Um, now, the, my proposition is, uh, is that is, is Lockean. My proposition is Lockean, and Locke, in his uh, second treatise, talks about utilization. He makes a fundamental difference or posits a binary between what is wasteland and what is cultivable land or cultured land. And uh, See, he uses the word wasteland at least 14 times in a essay that is of 11 pages. So that will tell you how much Locke was concerned with the idea of wasteland. The idea of wasteland cannot be ignored if one wants to look at the garden. The garden is, I believe, the wasteland's shadow. Or, uh, and, and therefore, I will approach the garden via the wasteland. 
Now, uh, this is, this is uh, there the are two things that go along. One is the idea of a terra nullius, uh, no man's land or a no a human's land, and the idea of a savage wasteland. This is what Locke says, the state of cultivated, utilized land that is not, that is cultured and claimed as property. Now, along with this is the theory of improvement and Locke posits the binaries of savagery, wildness, uh, besides culture and cultivation. And uh, this forms the basis of garden making, not only in, uh, in, the, in England, it also forms the basis of colonization, because the colonies are looked upon as wastelands to be improved. You see, the very idea of lock of utilization of land in England is something that is transported to the colonies as places which are wild and savage and must be utilized and improved upon. And uh, there is a lot of similarity between such utilization theories and, of course, Darwin's ideas of improvement. So they have to be looked, up, uh, looked at together. Now, so, uh, on the other hand, uh, while, I mean, I will read out from Locke, there is also the question of gardens as uh, taxonomically differentiating the wild and the cultivated. So I'm making two different points over here. One, that the idea of the garden cannot be looked uh, apart from uh, the idea of the waste or the waste and the common land. And that Locke's treatise, because it is separated by nearly a hundred years from the colonial, you know, the high noon of colonialism, therefore not many people posit this, uh, this connection between what Locke had said about English common lands and about Americas, which he proposed to be exploited because they were waste and wild and uh, uninhabited, you see? So if it is uninhabited, then of course it has to be utilized. It, the maximum must be extracted from it. Uh, the second point that I'm making, I mean, this, this is the first thing that Locke, the idea of uh, which he talks about the English commons, that they must be fenced off, they must be utilized, and something that he is deploying in the case of the Americas is something that becomes a kind of doxa, you know, a kind of assumption. A doxa would be a kind of cultural assumption which is taken up by the likes of uh, uh, Bentham and the likes of the governor generals of India, who especially Lord Benting. Now, if we consider uh, Macaulay's uh, minutes as a kind of doxa of improvement of the Indian mind, then I think Benting's, uh, 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 Benting's uh, uh, orders could be considered as a doxa of improvement of Indian plantations and landscapes. So the, the question of a binary of what is waste and what is cultivable is, 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 is important. Now, uh, the second point, uh, and after this I go on to sort of look at it, land like labor must be utilized, extracted, exploited, fenced off, and taxonomically differentiated. The idea of a no man's land, an empty land, can be taken over and exploited, and this forms the basis of most plantations or commercial gardens. Now, the very uh, sort of fairly complicated point that I'm making is that the entire colonial exercise is an exercise in this binary thinking, that the colonies are empty places, that they are wastelands vis-a-vis -vis the cultured gardens of, uh, of England. 
uh, or European lands, and therefore they can be taken over because it is a uh, white man's burden, because it must be improved. Therefore, the people who are living in India, for example, are kind of invisibilized, and the land is taken over as a kind of duty because it has not been utilized. So you see, the, what I'm doing is kind of expanding the idea of the garden and looking upon that particular doxa of colonization that is very closely associated with the binarization of cultivated land and wasteland. Right, so England is that cultivated, utilized land, that fenced off, that completely, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's something that is made pertinent, if I may use a Foucauldian term, whereas the non-pertinent land, the unutilized land is something that must be colonized. So gardening goes a little deeper than, you know, picturesque gardens, but serves as a logic of occupying places which are seen as, uh, as uh, well, unutilized. All right. While this is done within England and uh, through various acts of fencing off the commons, it is proposed in the Americas, which is a place where Europeans go and settle. And it is also something that forms the logic of colonization. So all land that is taken up is not simply taken up, as people say, because the Indians are uh, infantile, or the Indians are feminine, or they are effeminate. I mean, it is not just a gendered or a, you know, a age-related logic that is used. There is also the logic of cultivation that is at the heart of the colonizing process. Now, the second point that I was going to make is once a land is actually occupied, it is you know, made possible for cultivation, then comes the idea of making the garden as a kind of taxonomical difference. So within a colonized land, you will have kinds of gardens that differentiate between the colonizer and the colonized, the savage and the, uh, the, you know, the improved, the cultured person. So there will be, uh, in, say within the, uh, the Darjeeling tea estates with which I was quite fascinated. In fact, I was going to talk about the Assam tea gardens, but let me first start with Darjeeling, which is a classic case of uh, cultivation of a garden that is utilizable in a very specific sense, you know, a, a commercial utilization of a particular place. Now, and, and uh, Andrew would definitely be able to tell me the ways in which the, the, the Chinese variety of, of, uh, of tea was brought in into Darjeeling, but Darjeeling has in its slopes and in its, you know, the way the trees are placed naturally, uh, the effect of producing something peculiarly flavored, unlike, say, Kachar in, uh, in Assam, which has the Jungli uh, Jat. So within the gardens, you are already differentiating between the wild a garden and the more uh, cultured garden. And you see, let me make it a little more complicated. Within the garden of the champagne of India, that is Darjeeling tea, you have the Lloyd Gardens, which is a sort of sanctum sacrum within the garden. So that Lloyd Gardens, whose picture I had with me, when all tea gardens will have such a garden, is a place of rest and recuperation of the sahib, who is cultured. So there are many levels on which this works. On the one hand, here is, say, Kachar, which is a wild place, or, say, Darjeeling, which is a wild place, which Campbell says that no one has ever lived in. I mean, just imagine. I mean, there are so many people are there, and you wipe them away at one stroke. It's, it's, a, it's a terra nullius, and that has to be inhabited. Now, once it has to be inhabited, it has to be cultivated. Once it has to be cultivated, it has to be different. 
differentiated. And it is differentiated with the Assam kind of tea. And of course, this cultivation is a utilization within utilization because you're having something like a cash crop. The indigo, the tea, and, uh, and, and to an extent rice are all uh, examples of 19th century gardens in the sense that in the colony the idea of the garden is further transplanted into the garden of commercial use. You see, so the land is as it were repeatedly violated. You know, I don't want to use the word raped. I mean, it's violated, it's penetrated, it is you, the chemical um, uh, and toxins are used to make it more high yielding and of course the labor is also utilized which is seen as part of the land and this is all again supported by that doxa of utilization. However, within this garden which is a a place which is utilized, you have another garden, the Lloyd Garden, for example, which was built by Campbell, which is a very beautiful place like the gardens that Andrew just showed, very nice, very, and it has at its center something that I think should be mentioned, a gazebo. A gazebo is that place of rest and recuperation where the human can be at the center of trees and flowers and, you know, rocks and stones and other uh, organized things. So that, I think, is, is interesting about the kind of garden idea that was transplanted into India, into other colonies of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, the, of, of, of Britain. And uh, of course, each of these tea gardens, I have visited one called Rose Kandi in Shilchar, which is just besides the Assam University, and it also has that gazebo. You see, anybody who has seen Sound of Music will have remembered the nice dance between I am 16, you, you are 17 or something, which is within a gazebo. A gazebo is the center of the garden and inscribes the centrality of the human being who has made the garden possible. Now, as I was saying earlier on, uh, the garden within a garden is a way of differentiating the natives from the sahibs. So the natives don't have, even the, the Bengali managers don't have access to the gazebo. The gazebo is a place for the white person. And that is where, you know, that is the taxonomy of difference. So the garden is also there so that you, uh, white men and women can roam around, the children can play, and it is not a garden in which everybody is welcome. So the garden, the access of the garden is something we need to think about. The garden is not accessible to everybody. While the tea garden is accessible to its laborers and is used to optimize that uh, garden, the gazebo within that garden is not accessible to all. It is, it is, it is cut off. Now, um, yes, just, uh, you know, just something from Locke, just in case you think I haven't done anything. Um, land that is left wholly to nature. I have taken down all the 14 quotations. Land that is left wholly to nature that has no improvement of pasturage, tillage or planting is indeed called wasteland. And we shall find the benefit of it amounting to little or more than nothing. He who appropriates land to himself, this is very, very famous, he who appropriates land to himself by his labor increases the stock of mankind, the provisions from an area of cultivated and enclosed land are 10 times more than yielded by ones that are lying waste in the common. I like this sentence because I compare it in my classroom with the Macaulayan lines that one shelf of European literature is equal to the entire stock of Sanskrit and Arabic literature. So, you know, the idea that one little bit of 
land that is uh, cultivated is equal to 10 times of the waste land. So what is waste and what is cultivated, of course, is a matter of, uh, of discursive uh, structures. Now, I had these, uh, uh, this is the Lloyd Garden. Anyway, since it can't be seen, it can't be seen. Now, uh, the, I, uh, there are several laws uh, which uh, were, especially in colonial India, I will refer to the Gualpara laws of 1871, by which the idea of wasteland is uh, introduced into India, and by which all land can be taken by the government in order to cultivate them. So even if you are residing somewhere, sometimes the government feels that, all right, you know, this is a place where tea can be grown or maybe indigo can be grown. You can be just thrown off by that. The Gualpara laws still remain, okay, the 1871 laws. Many of our colonial laws are still intact. Nothing much has been done to them, except a little tweaking here and there. You know? So uh, that's, that's also interesting. The idea of kash and the idea of arm. What land is kash and what land is arm? Now, I will come to, uh, you know, not the tea garden, because, uh, see, the tea garden would require a lot of showing things, but since I am the par and the point, therefore, I will come to someone who is very close to my heart and hopefully close to your hearts as well, and that person is Rovindranath Thakur. Now, I will refer to the Shantini Keton, which actually means a garden of peace, but the interesting thing about Shantini Keton is the gazebo. All right, the Upashona Griho is a kind of uh, reconstituted gazebo. It's, it's a, a non-secular gazebo. You see, the Upashona Griho is, a, is exactly placed like the gazebo in the Kew Gardens, the same array of trees, and you see that, you know, the Kachir Ghar, the glass house, where you don't sing, I am 17, you are 16, but you pray to the Lord. So anyway, uh, but the, uh, it, it also formed the basis of a, um, the horrible movie that I saw called uh, Posto, you see, where people are sitting and singing uh, songs about the Upashana. Now, but the interesting thing about uh, Rabindranath's taking up of the idea, actually, uh, you know, Devindranath's taking up of the idea of the wasteland is that entire Bhuvandangar Mart and that that area, which was seen as a terra nullius, a wasteland, which it wasn't a terra nullius. There were various people over there, but it was converted. The, it was made into a lovely garden. And of course, at the center, you have the Upashana Griho as the gazebo, where you uh, recall the Lord and you, you, know, you pray. Now, uh, the, uh, I would like to, you know, be, uh, because I would like to end with Virginia Woolf, but I'm not going to make this British at all because there is Andrew Rudd to do that. I will keep it to my country. I, I would like to refer to the numerous, numerous novels, stories, plays on the garden in Shakespeare, I'm sorry, in Rabindranath's, in Rabindranath's play, uh, uh, novels and plays and songs and stories. Yes, it's such a Freudian slip. It shows that I've been teaching English for a very long time. Here, here is Maluncho. This is Maluncho. Maluncho is about, a, um, about two women and a man and a garden. All right, and it has very allegorical names like the man is called Aditto or the sun, and the woman is called Niroja or maybe uh, a poddo, uh, a lotus, and the, um, the, uh, the other woman is called Sharula. All right, and of course, there is the garden that is not only beautiful, but it is utilized, and the garden is the cause of their wealth. And of course, when Niroja does not have a child, she has an aborted experience. She is bedridden, and the garden also begins to wither away. So Sharula is brought in, and she is the young blood. And of course, here again, the, uh, the binary of the hola 
Mali, the gardener who is, uh, you know, who has no training. And of course, uh, um, Sharola, who is trained as a gardener. She has the Western techniques of gardening and how the seeds can be curated and how better plants can be. In fact, there's a long sort of, you know, discussion about what are the ways in which flowers can be made or better plants can be made. And of course, the friction that a lot of erotic desire is played out over the garden, over its planting, over its growing, over its soil manuring, all right? So the garden becomes the area of tussle. The garden becomes the area where, uh, you know, love is played out. And of course, in the end, there is a kind of giving over, a, you know, a resolution on the part of Niroja, who's an older woman who wants to give over her husband and her garden. But it is an inconclusive ending because Niroja cannot give either, you see. So she is like a thin, shino uh, figure who stands up in her chemise and she says, Debona, Debona. So, you know, Rakkushi Debona. So, you see, it is a garden that is not given over. So, uh, while Maluncho seems to be such a nice sort of, you know, soft, title, it is a fairly rough kind of uh, narrative. I mean, it's not for the weak. Now, I will uh, come back to the, the, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, novelette that is Nashtonir, and of course, it's the it's, uh, equivalent Charulata, because in both, the garden is is used as an idea of improvement. In fact, I have a feeling that Nat might have read Locke. I mean, I don't have any empirical evidence, but I mean, it's quite possible that he had read Locke. And uh, in fact, everything about Nashtonir is about improvement. If you notice, and I have the book with me, if you notice, the whole story starts with uh, Amol and uh, Charu actually discussing the garden. You see, and then, of course, in Shottojit Rai's movie, I'm going to discuss both together. There is the, uh, the that song, Phule Phule Dhole Dhole, so, which is a kind of a signature song, you see, because in the movie, of course, there is no way of saying things which Rabindranath did say in the novel. So the song is the way of foregrounding the, the garden as the garden of desire, the garden in which the erotic desires are circulated. And the garden is seen as something that is fallow, unutilized, and it is something that both Charu and Amol want to improve. Th that never really happens because it requires a great deal of money and a great deal of practical sense, which neither Charu nor Amul have. Plus, they have to borrow money from the husband, which is not a good idea. You see, I mean, they are having a nice peekaboo and they want to ask the husband for to finance that. So that is not about to happen. The garden is the place where, for the first time, Amol suggests that Charu should write. The, diff the similarity between writing as improvement, learning as improvement, and the Macaulayan idea, in fact, I could, you know, if I could show you the slides of how much Benting is like Macaulay in far as plantation is concerned, you know, the acts of plantation, that plantations will improve Indians, gardens will improve Indians, it will utilize Indians. Anyway, so it doesn't happen, the garden is not fructified, but Rabindranath's novel, uh, a novelette, actually speaks about how many things that could be done in gardens. You know, th that becomes a kind of doxa for the Indian novel and cinema. If you have seen so many movies where you go for a picnic, where there is a garden, and the common people, as Rabindranath has said, they have chire doi. That's interesting. They are not, they don't have mangsho and luchi, but the rest have a marvelous time, and they uh, swim, 
and they, it is actually shown in Chokhet Bali, I think, as one of the sequences, many of Rituparno, Rituparno is very sort of, you know, doxaic about Tagore. So, uh, so he, the, he will, he will go and there will be a swim and of course you will see the body of the man who is swimming and the garden is the place where you know there can be that circulation of desires but of course it is controlled it is part of an improvement program now here i'm going to be a little more serious because in charulata there is also a garden within a garden because there are two women as usual and three men and uh, the two women that I'm talking about are Mandakini and Charulata. Now Mandakini is the uncultured garden. You see, she is someone who talks about Amra Khawa. Amra being a wild uh, and about Amra Gach. That is the conversation they have in Nashtuni. That and both Amul and Charu laugh because they are talking about petunias and daffodils and kinds of you know, sophisticated things. So obviously, and things that nobody has heard about in colonial Bengal at that point of time. In Gora also, there are some fruits which nobody has ever eaten, flowers which nobody has ever seen. So these are curated, these are cultured. But Mandakini wants to have things which are sour and you know, she's, she's uncultured. Of course, she can't read, whereas uh, Charu can read. She can't uh, sew. She can't, uh, you know, actually do a carpet, which is something that Charu can do. That, again, is a very interesting part in, in Shotojit Rai's movie, where there is the acculturation of Charu Lata is shown besides her swinging in the garden and that line of ki jani ki shero lagi prano kore hai hai it is it is a refrain that you know is is binds the novel and the idea of the uncultured the uncultivated garden and the cultivated woman and the uncultivated heart which cannot be restrained. For all the cultivation, when the storm comes like Hore Murare, then of course the garden is all uh, dispersed. So uh, uh, I think uh, you know, that should be enough. I will end with a favorite in, uh, short story of mine, which is Kew Gardens by Virginia Woolf. And I like the, I have an edition of Vanessa Bell. See, even somebody who's like an Amragat sometimes has some nice things, okay? So, uh, uh, so most uncultured, most uh, somebody whose things don't work out, but still I do have a copy of, the, uh, of Vanessa Bell. And uh, the interesting thing about Kew Gardens is that it is a, uh, it includes not only, the Kew Gardens of course is the center of the novel, but it also includes people who are, uh, well, homosexual, clearly, people who are not quite sane, people who are not cultivated, you see, people who are rough, edged, and of the snail, who, whose point of view is also a matter of concern. So it is a story that is not a story because it has lots of pictures in it. It is not about the aristocrats. It is about the unhinged mind. It is about the war and shell shock. It is about the snail in the garden as Rudd's last picture showed and the snail's point of view. So that is something in which we may reside. Thank you. So following um, uh, Professor uh, uh, Nandini Bhattacharya's talk, we have another um, talk on, um, the nine, on the colonial tea garden in literature. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, my apologies. Dr. Anve Mukhalpadhyay is going to talk on reflections on the hybridized space of the Royal Garden and Menagerie in colonial India with special reference to the menagerie of the Maharaja of Burdwan. I have to say a few words uh, about Dr. Mukhopadhyay. He is uh, assistant professor in the department um, uh, 
of English and Cultural Studies in the University of Burdwan. He was a previously an assistant professor at Banaras Hindu University. He is widely published. Um, it looks like he is an expert, really, on uh, on uh, tantric traditions. Um, he has published Hindu tantric traditions, Devi as a corpse, and also literary um, and cultural readings of the goddess. What I find most interesting here is his documentary uh, film, Saraswati, the Daughter of uh, Saraswati, um, and this was a f this is a film um, uh, about women's education in Varanasi, and it is available on YouTube. So please welcome Dr. Anaya Mukhopadhyay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and it's actually good that my slot has been shifted because uh, okay. the discussions that we have already heard would uh, sort of operate as a kind of background to what I am going to talk about. And I think uh, you are basically going uh, from a more uh, global perspective to more localized perspectives. And I will do that. In fact, many things that you know, Nandini has talked about would find resonance in my paper as well. But I would talk about the deeper nuances. Okay? For instance, you know, with Zazibu, she was talking about the sanctum sanctorum, so the politics of exclusion as far as the gardens are concerned. I will talk about that as well. But uh, mainly, I would try to connect the colonial gardens, and particularly menagerie, because when I had a talk with Chandravadi, I was, uh, uh, I mean, I suggested that I would talk about the menagerie. And you know, it was a point of interest, because whenever we talk about the gardens, we generally focus on the plants. But the animals were also being relocated, re-territorialized. So what about that? And secondly, I would try to reconnect this, uh, this scenario of the colonial garden and the menagerie to the Sanskritic traditions, the literary traditions, and also the traditions of gardening in ancient India, so pre-Mughal India. You know, uh, Of course, while talking about the garden and menagerie of Bardhaman Raja, the Raja of Bardhaman, I uh, could have talked about the palimpsestic structures where you have the embedding of the, uh, the sort of influences of the Sanskritic traditions, then the Mughal gardens, and then the colonial imitation, the mimicry as well, but since they are have been presentations on Mughal gardens, I guess. I will not get into that. I will mainly focus on the connection between uh, sort of uh, the Hindu imagery of the garden and the politics included in that kind of uh, imagery. And I will try to connect that with the colonial politics of garden making. So when we look at the Raja's garden or menagerie in colonial India, we come across the dynamics of the same kind of adaptation or cannibalistic translation uh, as we find in the literary garden of the colonial contact zones. I deliberately use the terms from uh, post-colonial translation studies because I find this idea of translation very interesting in this context because in translation too, the same kind of thing was happening. A genre was getting transplanted into the Indian literary soil, if we can use such an expression, and, uh, and the adaptation was also going on. So I think as far as the Raja's garden is concerned, because so far we have basically uh, hard about the gardens, I mean, in today's uh, presentations, which have the agency of the British, you know, the agency of the colonial master, but there were also multiple agencies. And even when we think about the British agency in making the gardens, there are sort of multiple points of reference. For instance, I'm not just thinking about India. I have seen this in Cyprus as well. Many of the heritage, heritage sites in India, Cyprus, Nepal, uh, were actually reformulated and restructured by the British. So there were multiple trajectories of garden making and uh, management of space in colonial times. Okay. Between the text as garden and garden as text, there are many commonalities in terms of the aesthetics of hybridization and cultural transplantation. To be precise, I would put forward the claim that Rajmohan's wife, that famous text of Bonkin Chandro, and the menagerie of the Bardhaman Raja are comparable in terms of their functions within the transculturative polysystem. The garden opens up before us, in this context, the picture of an ecological re-territorialization and amalgamation of indigenous and European figurations of the garden within the context of the pleasures of space as text. And how these uh, pleasures are produced would be the main focus of my paper. A scattering and gathering of biotic resources, not within the fluid diaspora scape, but within the more concrete and stable space of colonial India. 
However, I don't see the Raja's garden or menagerie only in terms of the aesthetics of transculturation as a sort of vernacularization or localization of the European garden, but rather as a sort of, uh, as a kind of locus of the political hybridization of the Indic and colonial strategies of making order, making borders, and making prominent the spatial radiation of quote unquote royal power. Because this is very important for me. Why is it the case that when the true Raj is there, the British Raj is there, uh, the Rajas of the native states or the princely states or even the non-princely states. For instance, Bordhaman was not a princely state actually, unlike the Kujbiyar uh, estate. But why was it that they were being encouraged by the British to continue with this Raja hood? Now, of course, there was a politics behind that because this illusion that I am also a Raja in the colonial space, you know, even though there is a Raja. So this uh, kind of assumption of royalty on the part of the native kings was very important. As Angelia Poon observes, the garden of the colonizer in the colonized land may be associated with the trope of taming the alien land that Nandini was talking about and heralding order and representing the ideals of the civilizing mission. In Africa, in India, this trope has been operational time and again, but in the context of colonial India, we need to notice the intricate ways in which these tropes of making order have assumed a hybridized character intermingling the specifically Indic modes of taming land with the, colonial, with the colonial ones. In other words, the Raja's garden draws on the Indic traditions of order making as well as the European ones. That is what I would like to focus on. And in this context, I would like to refer to Eugenia Herbert's book, Flora's Empire, where she talks about the garden imperialism, a kind of uh, superimposition of the cartography of the garden as a kind of bordered and ordered territory onto the colonial landscape. And she says that we need to explore the dynamics of this garden imperialism. But I would argue in my paper, we look at the uh, shifting of the agency from the British garden maker to the indigenous garden maker, like you know the Raja of Bardhaman, we need to notice the ways in which the Indic traditions of order making and the European traditions of order making or the colonial traditions are getting mixed up. As Prabhakar Bhagwat points out in the gardens of India, in ancient India, especially in Ashoka's kingdom, a special emphasis was laid on the composition of parks and gardens. Kalidasa and the other Sanskrit poets give sensuous descriptions of gardens. These descriptions include magical gardens, semi-divine spaces, royal gardens, etc. However, the interconnecting thread running through these different genres of gardens is basically the theme of order. These gardens are the places of pleasure, sometimes places for spiritual contemplation, but almost always marked by the logic of an order. This is what we need to notice because we often have a very peculiarly depoliticized notion of the Sanskritic gardens, you know, and Rabindranath is also responsible for that because he tries to build up that kind of illusion of the Tapavana, uh, I mean, uh, in comparison to the colonial spaces. In the Tapavana, which is not a garden sensu stricto, it, it's somewhere between the garden and the forest, the spiritual energy of the rishis controls the animals, shapes wildness into a spiritually ordered reality where animals, plants, and humans live harmoniously. But this harmony is actually managed in a way. So this is not really spontaneous. So outside the borders of the Tapavana, the animals are no longer uh, you know, less wild. They are really wild, and they will eat you up. So that tiger is laughable, probably. The tiger is fine inside the Tapavana, but once you come out of the Tapavana, the tiger is going to eat you up. That, that is the imagery constructed by, uh, and basically there is also an emphasis, an implicit emphasis on the Brahminical power. So we need to focus on that as well. Okay. In the Kumaravana, in the Vikramarvashya of Kalidasa, Urvashi is turned into a vine because in this holy garden of Kartikeya, women are not allowed. So you would be reminded readily, I guess, of what? Shavarimana. So, uh, and in all these different versions of gardens, parks, bounded spaces of vegetation, what is common can be denoted through a negative. It's the cancellation or negation of wildness and wilderness. The wild is tempted, the potentially problematic entrants are discouraged or cursed or kept away. 
The bounded space operates as an area of exclusion where the space becomes pleasurable for someone due to the bounded textualization of that space. And here I do think of Mary Douglas's idea that the bounded entity, for instance, she talks about the body as the archetypal metaphor for any kind of bounded entity which would in its turn denote political control or order. Out of the chaos of the wilderness, the spatial text is prepared and it becomes the locus where pleasure and power crisscross. This pleasure power nexus is extended in later Hindu royal cultures by the association of gardens with temples. And here comes this idea. So I think that Kachbondi that also fits in, into this structure, you know, and this is very much evident in South India not so much in North India, but in the South Indian temple cultures, the gardens and the sort of uh, proximity of the gardens to, to the temple, this is very important. As Bhagavad points out, according to information about the Chola kings in South India, their cities were well developed with well planned gardens. The great South Indian temples usually had water tanks in their compounds with gardens attached to them. Invariably, such gardens were called Nandanavanam or heavenly gardens. This is uh, the Bijay Bahar. It, uh, it was not constructed in the 19th century, but uh, it was very much in the sort of Victorian ambience that uh, this came up. This Vijay Bahar is actually the, should I uh, expand it? Yeah. Now, uh, here, uh, basically, it's a large garden. And uh, Bijay Chand Mahatab, who was the king of Bardhaman, I mean the Raja of Bardhaman at that point of time, and he took Lord Karzan to Bardhaman. And in fact, uh, I will show you the building where uh, uh, Karzan stayed and had a tea party with, Kar uh, with the Raja of Bardhaman. And uh, just beside that building, we have our uh, sort of uh, department, so Nondidi and I teach there. And just beside that building, there is that sort of heritage building, but it's not, I don't know why, it's not considered a heritage building. Uh, and we have occupied that building. So, <laughs> at bottom. <laughs> so, these are kind of decolonization and de heritageization, uh, if you wish. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, here you had the garden, and in the middle of the garden, there is this temple. And it's also interesting to notice that this temple is built not in the Bengal style, but in the Nagra style, you know, in the North Indian uh, temple style. So, it's Stylistically and uh, sort of architecturally, it's actually akin to the Durga temple in Banaras. Then this is again another picture, and I will tell you why I had to download these pictures from the from certain websites rather than taking the pictures because you know they will not allow you to enter those temples apart from the days of Shivaratri. So even though the Raja is no more there, this policy of exclusion as a trace remains there. So this is the trace of royalty, as it were, the royalty that was assumed at that point of time. OK, so that is there. And around the temple, there, there is a very beautiful garden. There is also a uh, water body. OK, so I will come back here later on. And uh, in South India, such gardens uh, which were there uh, just around the temples were called Nandanavanam, or heavenly gardens. Here we get another very important reference point for critically revisiting the gardens from the Sanskritic tradition. The heavenly garden of Indra is often projected as a lucrative space of pleasure. It's not only the Asuras or the demons who coveted it. Krishna himself fought with Indra for the Parijata tree in the Nandanavana. Excuse me. When the Raja in colonial India, such as the Raja of Bard one sets up a garden or a garden palace or a menagerie. He betrays the des desire for the agency to transplant, to re-territorialize beings, plants, or animals, just as a white colonizer gardener would also do. The appetite for the agency of transplantation or re-territorialization is probably the key political factor here. The forced diversity of the managed ecology of the garden or zoo betrays the depth of the king's potency to re-territorialize plants and animals. That's why I began by referring to the binary of the diaspora and colonial India, because we often have this idea that only the diaspora is the space of movement, and the colonial uh, setup is a more static space. But uh, that kind of idea is a very problematic idea, because there we believe that this re-territorialization need a subject. 
Right. So it doesn't need an agency. So there is a, a false belief that you can re-territorialize yourself in accordance with your will, but that's not the case. And if we look at the colonial uh, histories of deterritorialization and re-territorialization, we'll come to understand that the agency was actually not in the hands of the person who was getting re-territorialized, but rather in the hands of someone else in the colonial power in most cases. I would locate this art symbolically in an event narrated in the Puranas like the Vishnu Purana, the Vishnu Parva of the Harivangsha and the Bhagavata Purana. And again, I here intervene and say that it was a larger colonial structure of, uh, you know, of uh, activating the agency to re-territorialize re the others, but that was not totally alien to the Hindu ideologies of power as well. You know? So that is what uh, I'm arguing here. The story goes like this. Satyabhama, the wife of Krishna, had urged Krishna to take a Parijata tree from Indra's heavenly garden. And after a protracted battle between Krishna and Indra, when Indra won, sorry, when Krishna won, he brought a Parijata tree from Nandanavana and got it planted in the palace garden of Satyabhama. Here, the royal power is symbolically connected with the agency of re-territorializing a tree, the capacity for effecting the ecological translation of a, biotic, of a biotic entity to one's own land. Now, this is again interesting because this particular event is associated with the history of Krishna's coronation in Dwaravati. So, this is not the Krishna of Vrindavan, this is not the Krishna even of Mathura, but the Krishna of Dwaraka, who is a king. So, he's the king in Dwarka, and that, that is very important. Yeah. The British too saw, uh, sorry, used this, uh, this kind of agency of re-territorializing someone or something as one of the pillars of colonial power. While we often tend to see colonialism from the perspective of settlement, we need to reorient our post-colonial thought to the issue of the forced migrations caused by colonialism. Slavery, indentured labor, eviction of Adivasis, deportation of the extremists, if you think about the extremists uh, who were deported to Andaman, the brute power of moving space. Can't we see the partition of India as the culmination point of this continuous showcasing of the power to forcibly re-territorialize others as the last laugh of imperialism? The Raja, the mimic man, the beezer offspring of colonial modernity and medieval feudalism, tried to mimic the power of the British to re-territorialize beings. However, whereas the entire collectivity of the colonized humans, animals, and plants, the Rajas of non-princely states included, was the object of the biopower of the British Raj. The Raja, or the Babu, in more localized, less glamorous contexts, and Chandravadi has worked on the Babu's gardens, could exert this biopower most intensively over animals, birds, and trees in the limited space of the garden or menagerie. I don't say that they didn't exert this kind of biopower over their human subjects, but of course, that kind of use of biopower was limited in their case, whereas as far as the colonial system was concerned, it had almost you know, unlimited uh, um, uh, access to this biopower, a kind of global biopower. The garden or menagerie became the colony of the Raja, the limited kingdom, a micro Raj, perhaps. So here I talk about this attitude to assume the royal power of re, uh, of re territorializing someone else. Now, this attitude is basically colonial in nature, and this has been explored in Bengali literature time and again. For instance, you may be reminded of Chia Khana, that Sharadindu story, and that was adapted by Satyajit Ray as well. Now, what is this man doing? This man is deliberately uh, setting up a Chia Khana, which means a manager or a zoo, and he tries to relocate the beings from other places. It's a different issue that, you know, finally he himself is killed, so that's a different issue. Okay, now to come particularly to the uh, managery of the Bardhaman Raja, the Calcutta Review, uh, volume 21, it, uh, and July, December uh, 1853, that is the uh, timing for this particular volume, it noted the opulence of the Raja of Bardhaman, and it also noted that the Raja of Bardhaman in the 1850s one, was one of the most uh, affluent uh, land, uh, sort of uh, Rajas within courts, or Zamindars, big Zamindars, from Bengal, and he paid a huge amount of revenue to the British. And the same uh, volume of the Calcutta Review also notes that the Raja had a fine managery, a splendid tank, 
30 acres in extent and spacious gardens. In 1855, Sanders, Combs, and Company published the rail and its localities or a guide to places along the railway line from Howrah to Raniganj. So at that point of time, the, uh, the, the so far unnoticed places were being included in the map of uh, tourism in British India. And this text appreciatively refers to the Raja's menagerie in Bordhaman, and I quote from this text, his menagerie in the garden, half a mile distant from the royal palace, which is still called Rajvati, and it now happens to be the administrative building of the University of Bordhaman. So that was the royal palace, and let me show you another picture. This is the Darul Bahar, uh, it was the summer uh, palace of the Raja, and it was also the garden palace. Uh, this is the, uh, I mean, situation of Darul Bahar now. This is the older picture, taken in 1904. Uh, I will talk about it uh, in some detail. Uh, but before that, let me uh, get back to this description. So uh, this text describes his manager in this way. His menagerie in the garden, half a mile distant from the uh, um, original palace, li is liberally supported at a monthly expense of 8,000 rupees, and it's well worth a visit. The garden, which occupies a large space, contains a great variety of plants and has had three lakhs of rupees expended on it by the Raja within the last four years. But for want of proper shed, thousands of valuable plants have been lost." Unquote. The same text lists some of the animals included in the Raja's menagerie, and the list is really interesting. Let me quote again. Nepal squirrels, swans, pelicans from the polar regions, which cost uh, rupees 800 a pair, barred one wolf. Uh, of course, in Bardhaman, there are no wolves anymore. Yeah, you need not be afraid. Uh, Sealand monkeys, porcupine, boa, <laughs> Borneo monkey, North American cockatoo, which had cost uh, 1,000 rupees a pair, Hyena, orangutan, uh, tiger cat, basil vulture, sloth bear, Kashmir pigeons, turtle doves, Kashmir goat, emu, ostrich, wildfowl. So that was the sheer biodiversity of the menagerie of the Raja of Bardhaman. Uh, this text doesn't refer to the lions, but the Raja also had lions, and I will come to that. Holana Chandra, in the travels of a Hindu to various parts of Bengal and Upper India, volume two, and it was published in London in 1869, speaks highly of the opulent vegetation marking the city of Bardhaman. And he says, and I quote, in all directions, the scenery fully justifies its ancient poetical appellation of Kushumpur. So, so Bardhaman was originally called Kushumpur or the city of flora. The very walks leading to the town lie through a succession of groves, orchards, gardens, and flower pots. And Bharat Chandra's Bardhaban Mahasthan Choudikete Pushpobon is true to the very letter. This is what Bholana Chandra says. Now, he is here referring to the description of the lush green uh, nature of the city of Bardhaman as uh, found in um, uh, Vidya Shundar or Bharat Chandra. And interestingly, when Bholana Chandra talks about Bardhaman, he continuously switches between colonial Bardhaman and pre-colonial Bardhaman, because Vidya Shundar was uh, actually set in Bardhaman. Vidya was the princess of Bardhaman, and Bharat Chandra had no flattering things to say about the Bardhaman uh, estate. Nevertheless, Bolana Chandra also talks about the uh, sort of the possessions of the Raja, and he says that the Raja had a large stable of horses and elephants, an excellent dairy and aviary. The favorite amusements of the present Raja uh, are architecture and gardening, that is what Chandra says. He's taxed for carrying them into an e uh, excess. Finally, Volana Chandra underlines the majesty of Dilkhu Sabag, which is now the Golabba campus of the University of Bardhaman. Focusing on the menagerie of the Raja, which was the main attraction of this bag or garden, Chandra says, and I quote, the pair of lions there staggers the orthodox Hindu in his belief of the unity of the king of the forest. In Brahminical zoology, the species lion has no mate and multiplication. But instead of one, the number found here is dual, a male and a female, and they have also produced progeny in, uh, in large numbers. The lion also is an invisible creature according to the Puranas, but the old fellow is so great an aristocrat as to make himself something more than merely visible to the human eye. 
and then uh, he ends by saying something very interesting because his basic agenda is to show the shifts in the Hindu sensibility under the under uh, you know uh, mm, the colonial rule, and he is very happy about the fact that you know that we are coming out of our prejudices. But still, just look at the uh, politics here. He is referring to himself as the Hindu because Bolana Chandra, as uh, as a totally cultivated, if I borrow on this term, as a totally cultivated person, would not be so um, appealing to his British audience in London as he would be as a Hindu, quote unquote. So a kind of self anthropologization is also going on here. In this sense, at least, you know, I don't see any difference between the lion who is caged there and Bolana Chandra who thinks that he is free, but he is himself anthropologizing, anthropologizing himself. Chandra's rhetoric underscores the magic of the hybridization of the Hindu sensibility within the context of ecological re-territorialization. The Puranic lion is defamiliarized when the Hindu subject of the British Raj stands in front of the quote-unquote foreign lion. The Hindu mythological associations of the lion are dissolved for Bholana Chandra, but not actually, and I'm coming to that. The real lion is revealed in all its foreignness. However, while the Raja's collectorial urge to re-territorialize the foreign lion in his menagerie may not satisfy the shakti with the vision of the goddess riding the lion, because this is what he says, that no goddess rides upon them to bless the vision of a shakti. So this is the ironic comment made by uh, Bholana Chandra about the lion he sees in the menagerie. Still, uh, it can be argued that the lion is not present in the menagerie exactly in its foreign context because it is decontextualized and re-territorialized ecologically, unlike the plants which have not survived in the Raja's garden because there, uh, I mean, there were a lot of plants which were relocated from uh, far, far up places to the Raja's garden, but they didn't survive because there was not proper shade. So the Raja didn't know, you know, how to make them survive. So it was a mimicry without the proper know-how. Uh, yeah. Unlike the plants which have not survived, the lions have survived and produced progeny. Here, though the goddess is not apparently present, we need not think that the hybridized context of the symbolic implications of the Raja's re-territorialization of the lion doesn't require Hindu references at all. In fact, Bihani Sharkar, in her book, uh, Heroic Shaktism, argues that there was a close connection between heroic Shaktism and uh, royal power in the Hindu traditions, and the Bardhaman Raja was not outside this Texas. So, even though there is no goddess on the back of the lion in his menagerie, that doesn't mean that the, uh, the trope of heroic shaktism and the lion in his menagerie can really be disconnected. At least I find connections between these two phenomena. Again, in the Avigyana Shakuntalam, Sarvadamana, the son of Shakuntala and Dushyanta, who is the future Varata or the great forefather of the greatest kings of Varata Varsha, is shown as bravely playing with a lion, as a sort of lion tamer. Is not the throne itself called the Singhasana or the lion seat in Sanskrit? On the other hand, in Shaivism and Shaivistically oriented notions of royalty, there is the focus on Shiva being the god of beasts or Pashupati. Here, the humans as well as animals are part of the category of the Pashu, and the god is the lord of all of them. The Raja who can keep animals as exotic and ferocious as lions positions himself in the place of the lord of the tamed beasts. Taming the alien is at the core of the colonial imaginary, but that trope of taming is not alien to the Hindu ideologies of royalty either. In many of the temples in and around the royal gardens of Bardhaman, the, the deity was Shiva, and the temples had lush green surroundings. In Rajendra Malik's Marble Palace too, side by side with a the menagerie, there was a temple, though not of Shiva. In that case, it was uh, a temple of Jagannatha. However, as in pre-Christian Greco-Roman cultures in Hinduism too, there is a holistic cosmology where animality, humanity, and divinity bleed into each other. They are not seen as ontological opposites. Nevertheless, in the menagerie of the colonial garden of the Raja, which is beside the temple, the focus is not on the continuum of animality, divinity, and humanity, but rather on the system of control, radiating from the temple, the apparent spiritual core, to the power of the king, and then finally to the animals confined to a controlled ecological space. It smells of order, of the domestication of the platonic inner beast that the imperialist dis would emphasize time and again. The trajectory of hybridization in the garden space apparently focused on the familiarization of the foreign 
the domestication of the outlandish, but it also defamiliarized the familiar, the Puranic lion, for instance. The biotic items of the Raja of Bardwan had various geoecologic origins. When put together, they were part of a hybrid pleasure garden, a special text that involved the classical Indian tropes of the forced relocation of beings as a marker of royal grandeur and the colonial dynamics of forced re-territorialization. The Raja, a participator in the Raj without complete royal agency, could re-territorialize only animals from foreign lands, whereas the colonial masters would re-territorialize people, including Rajas or Nawabs. Think of Wajid Ali Shah from uh, Awad. Assets, resources on a global scale. The uh, argument is going on. For instance, Shashi Tharoor has said that the British uh, had uh, stolen a huge amount of money. Like, you know, we always talk about uh, uh, this stealing in euphemistic terms, you know. We shy away from using the term stealing, you know. So that is our post-colonial euphemism. But I think it was there, stealing. The Raja's menagerie thus represents a domain of pleasure that survives as a bizarre biotic collage, a hybrid text that seeks to participate in the project of the global imperial scripting, but falls short of being acknowledged as a meaningful participant in the global project of re-territorialization that couldn't but be at the heart of colonialism. Nevertheless, it does succeed in underpinning the rhetoric of taming, but what it tames is ridiculously outlandish, whereas the colonial power tames the alien in a much more effective way. The Raja of Bardwan tames the lion and puts it in a zoo. The British Raj, whose zoo was the entire empire, tames all the Rajas and re-territorializes humans who were foolishly rooted in the illusion of stability. Stability itself became an illusion. Think about the eve of the partition, you know, what happened on uh, the 15th of August in 1947. It's one thing to be surrounded by ostensibly tamed animals in your royal pleasure garden. It's a completely different thing to ensure the permanent loyalty of those animals. The manager of the British had taught the colonized how to relish and savor their own dehumanization, whereas the Rajas were happy only to see their animals procreate, multiply, and amuse the spectators. The spectator of the Rajas Menagerie forgot that he was, and I'm here thinking about Bolana Chandra, he forgot that he was subjected to a more comprehensive biopower, that he was the inmate of a larger, much larger menagerie, global in scope and constantly on the move, that the confined lions, laughable royalty, because Bolana talks about uh, the royalty of the lion in ironic terms, but he forgot that the confined lion's laughable royalty was a mirror for his own laughable self-perception as a quote-unquote human. So I end here, but uh, I would end, I will take just one moment more, one minute more, and I will briefly allude to the, uh, to the issue of Otabenga in Bronx Zoo in 1906. And a person like Madison Grant, interestingly, Grant was, at, at least at that point of time, was, he was not operating as an anthropologist. He was the secretary of the uh, New York uh, Zoological Society. But it was Madison Grant who said, Otavenga, this Mbuti man from Africa, stolen, again, stolen from Africa, um, should be put along with the apes in the Bronx Zoo. So it was his dictate. And he, in fact, continuously uh, argued for uh, keeping him along with uh, the apes. There was a huge uh, debate regarding that. Now, this kind of power of the colonial zoo, and even though uh, the USA was at that point of time not the USA today, the sort of master of the unipolar universe. Still, I would say that there was the same dynamics of colonial zoo making, you know? And that zoo could have the power to determine whether you are a human or an animal. Now, this power was, of course, denied to the Raja of Bortaman, even though he could have a lot of lions. Thank you. So we are running short of time. And so we are going to take just a few questions. Um, I would uh, really uh, uh, like to uh, say a few words about both the talks and how fascinating they were and how connected they were in our understanding of um, the dynamics between the garden and the landscape. The landscape can be a wasteland. It can be a productive you know, a vernacular landscape of fields. And in colonial India, of course, uh, we see the landscape uh, as from the British point of view as um, something to be wilderness, to be tamed and empty of uh, 
uh, of uh, any agency, but just as resources to be exploited. And um, uh, these presentations also have extended the meaning of garden itself as a gendered space, as a uh, space of where you know women come into their own, or women are excluded, or women are tamed uh, into desirable <laughs> uh, entities for for man's pleasure. Um, but also the garden as a as a uh, collection of flora and fauna, the menagerie. And again, I think I thank you for the wonderful presentation. Where does the idea of menagerie come from, really? I mean, because we can trace it to ancient India, and we can also trace it, you know, to to colonial India and to the Islamic India. So, with that, I invite questions. Um, uh, um, okay. So I have a question uh, um, for both of you. Um, now, Burdwan is a is a state, uh, and it's a very it looks like a very rich state. And so, um, uh, what is happening here in terms of the socio political economic dynamics in the 19th century, and how did the garden come about? Um, gardens come about. Uh, uh. Should I should I Okay, and that, thank you Amitadi, that is actually a very interesting question and uh, I would have liked to talk about this even in my paper, I couldn't for the paucity of time. Now, it's a very important issue in fact, uh, because if we look at the trajectory of the Bardwan Raj, that estate, we find that uh, during the Mughal period, they were very, uh, you know, uh, they actually they got the patronage of the Nawabs, the Mughal Nawabs. So this concept of Maharaja, this title continued from the Mughal times into the colonial times. Now, secondly, this um, uh, this particular garden actually served as the space of the congregation of various kinds of people. Of course, you know, sophisticated hierarch class, even from the ruling class of the uh, of the Raj itself. For instance, as I said, in 1904, Carson was invited there, and there is, it is a Carson gate. But at the same time, I would like to uh, talk about the other things which are not much known. For instance, in 1850s, George Thompson, the famous abol abolitionist ideologue, also visited the Rajas Garden. And in the library of the University of Manchester, actually there are the records of this uh, visit. Uh, Thompson used to write a lot of letters back home, and in those letters you find references to his visit, particularly to that building which I had uh, shown you. So, uh, interestingly, this was a space where people from the ruling class, people from multiple ide ideologies, sometimes even from the revolutionary or you know, quasi-revolutionary ideologies were also being brought there. And in fact, in the 1920s and 30s, there was a huge debate and the Bardhaman Raja was um, uh, almost falling from the favors of the British Raj and the colonial uh, sort of power because uh, at that point of time, he was patronizing Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bosch and Gandhiji, you know. Uh, so it was a very complex situation. And the Bardhaman Raja was seen as a, a subject-friendly Raja, even though you can't deny that he was also, you know, more friendly towards the sort of ruling class, the Raj, you know, whether it was the Mughal uh, Empire or the British Empire, than to the subjects. But the point is that he was not really so exclusive as many uh, other Rajas were. So he had a kind of friendly relationship with his subjects. Now, of course, you know, in a feudal order, uh, the subjects are never 100% happy. That is impossible. And that was not the case. But still, uh, as far as the local historians are concerned, as far as the people who have walked on the Bardwan uh, estate, uh, as far as their ideas are concerned, the Raja was to a great extent subject friendly. And I think another reason for that was that uh, the Bardhuman estate, even though they were talking about Rajas and they were assuming the illusion of a hereditary uh, kind of Raja hood, actually it was not hereditary at all. Probably you know about the Jal Pratap Chand Mamla. Gautam Bhadra has written in great detail about that. But apart from that, if you think about uh, the later uh, Rajas of Bardhuman, for instance, um, and Bijay Chand himself, actually they all came from outside the original uh, family, the original dynasty. So I think there was also this kind of very complex ideology of a kind of uh, hyphenated self-identification. That you know, this person knows that I'm as assuming royalty, but it's known to all the subjects that I am not really part of the royal lineage, you know. So on the one hand, he has to be friendly with the uh, colonial system of power, in order to continue with this illusion of uh, royalty, but 
on the other hand he also needs to connect with the subjects because the subjects know that in a way he is not the property just one thing to add to this that bardhuman was also the raja's palace was also the place where very many literary meets of exactly. a, about especially about the development of the bengali language so bardhuman raj palace has a lot of memories interestingly the rabindranath and bardhuman have a very interesting connection because in uh, nashtonir there is a reference to a marriage proposal that comes from bardhuman and it is the money of the bardhuman raj that will enable uh, the amol to ultimately go to the colonial center so one has to come through bardhuman to go to bilet in fact there is the constant you know alliteration of the ba there are in other like street patro there is a reference to the abject poverty of the bardhumanis especially because of the famines and the bardhuman rajas you know indifference to the same so both the things that bardhuman is a poor place you see it's a place where people are underdeveloped and it is far from calcutta which is the metropolis and the raja who is powerful you know and uh, is uh, these are things that tagore exploits in his novels i mean you need the bardhuman money just like rochester needs the money of the caribbean properties in order to go to the set yes uh, uh, we are co calling the session to a close and we'll be proceeding for lunch thank you all for um, <coughs> thank you both for a very wonderful <coughs> uh, set of papers and uh, 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 we will come back uh, right after lunch to continue with our um, the ending you know keynote of the of the seminar i would request all the guests to be seated in the uh, in the chairs over there our students will serve the lunch <laughs>